Now, from the makers of Cold Water Omo... The bar of the Bull and Bear must be the most exclusive bar in the City of London. It is never frequented by any other than those who make their money in the city. Brokers, jobbers, bankers, etc. All gather there in their sober city dress, and fortunes are made and lost over a glass of sherry. One group, round a small table in the corner, were quite typical. Their names were Todd Hunter, Boardman, and Jago. <laughs> Your sherry, sir. Yeah, thank you. Well, Boardman. Yeah, you were right, Todd Hunter. They up the dividend. And that means, Jago, that you owe me a drink. Uh, I'll sign the slip for sherry. Huh. Very well, Mr. Jago. Here we are. Thank you. Devil's best. Oh, sorry, Med. The drink will have to wait. Wired for sound these days, I huh? Yes, yes. New gadget. Transistorized communication. A sort of a portable secretary. <laughs> Henry put me onto it. I, I think he's got shares in the company that makes them. <laughs> Quite simple, really. When my office wants me, they call the answering service, and they transmit the bleep sounds. Well, that's the signal to call them back. Oh, hadn't you better do so? No, there's no need. It's just a reminder that it's time I left for our board meeting. Yeah, go on, Henry. Leave the sherry for Jago. We have work to do. The Avengers. John Steed and Emma Peel, The Avengers. So many women say, once an Omo user, always an Omo user. Because there's just no dirt that can stand up to the cleaning power of cold water Omo. It solves Mrs. Sutherland's washing problems for her. Very dirty oil or grease marks. Yes. If you use cold water Omo, there's no trouble at all. It comes out very, very easily indeed. There's no washing problem too difficult for cold water Omo. Over one million South African housewives have proved it. Lux is the beauty soap chosen by beautiful film stars around the world. They choose Lux for its rich, moisturizing lather. Lux, a beauty treatment as you bathe. Episode one of this story, in which John Steed and Emma Peel find they have business in the city, which starts when someone attempts to... Dial a deadly number. The man called Jago grinned cheerfully at Boardman and Todd Hunter as they left the table at the bar and walked sedately over to an old-fashioned hat stand. Todd Hunter removed his answering service transistor from his jacket pocket and slipped it into the outer pocket of his heavy tweed overcoat. As he did so, a newcomer to the bar seemed to collide with him. Oh, I, I, I do beg your pardon. I'm so sorry. Uh, quite all right. Excuse me. Todd Hunter wasn't to know that the man had very skillfully taken the transistor from the overcoat pocket and switched another similar gadget in its place. The two friends left the bar, and a few minutes later, they were back in their respective offices. Todd Hunter once again removed his overcoat, took the duplicate transistor, and clipped it inside his jacket top pocket. Then he joined the others in the boardroom. Yeah, I, I think there is no need to point out, gentlemen, that since the war, full employment and a rising standard of living have become the major economic requirements of this country. Accompanied as is inevitable by inflation. Todd Hunter droned on with his address. Various members, replete from luncheon in the Bull and Bear, fixed an expression of earnest concentration on their faces and closed their eyes. Back in the bar of the Bull and Bear, the man who'd bagged into Todd Hunter consulted his watch and moved to one of the many telephones. He smiled grimly as he began to dial a number. In the boardroom, Todd Hunter was concluding his speech. Therefore, gentlemen, the future for the industry looks very bright. 
For our company, I must say the outlook is healthy. Very healthy. <laughs> Not so healthy for Todd Hunter, who at that point swayed on his feet, clutched at his chest, tottered and collapsed face downwards across the boardroom table, knocking over a water cup. <laughs> A few hours later, John Steed walked slowly round the boardroom. When Mrs. Peel entered, he hardly glanced at her, but said, One really can tell a great deal about members of a board from the way they will scribble on the scrap pads. Doodling is the correct word, I believe. Now, look at this. Repressed personality. Now, whereas this one shows a deep-seated frustration. But whoever did it has my sympathy. Ah, but this, this is more difficult. Mysterious. Now, he keeps his desires and feelings to himself. A secretive nature. Mm. You might have drawn it yourself. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Peel. I have been summoned here with all urgency and no explanations. Do I have to guess why I'm here? Do you tell me straight or do we have to play quiz games? Steed took a folded evening paper from his coat pocket and slid it across the polished top of the boardroom table. Stop press. Chairman of Todd Hunter's dies. Share price is slashed. It happened right there where you're standing, less than two hours ago. Steed took a Hunter gold watch from his pocket, flipped it open, and consulted it. Yes, two hours ago. Well, that's an impressive watch. You? No, no. Legacy from my Uncle Bertie. It plays jingle bells if you open the back. See. How useful. Pity it's dented. Ah, Battle of the Somme, 1916. German bullet? Canadian mule, actually. Hmm. Yes, Todd Hunter died literally on this table two hours ago. Look, I'm sorry to appear unsympathetic, but I don't see why it should be of all that interest to us. He was the sixth company chairman's dropped dead in the last year. Thrombosis. Pressure of work. Each time the chairman was dynamic, virtually indispensable to his company, so, so the company stood to lose a good deal by his death. Well, it could be overwork. People do drop dead of strain. Uh, question, did they drop or were they pushed? All six of them? Why not? Motive. Your guess is as good as mine. A man dies, share prices drop, company becomes cheaper and therefore easier to take over. Fine. But for one thing, they weren't taken over. Hmm. Well, what next? A little dabble in high finance. Oh? Yes. Six chairmen with only one thing in common. A banker named Boardman. Now, see if you can get hold of any personal possessions that Todd Hunter had on him at the time of his death. I'll pay a visit to banker Boardman. We'll meet up later. Let's go, Mrs. P. <laughs> Boardman's, like most merchant bankers, operates from a parlor, a large ornate room with a great, thick carpets, and two ornate desks at opposite ends of the room. The room itself is paneled and lined with portraits and framed accounts. There are two doors, one Mr. Henry Boardman's and the other his partner John Harvey's. When John Steed entered, Henry Boardman stopped signing letters and rose to greet him. Oh, my apologies, Mr. Steed. Will you take sherry and biscuits with me? Thank you. It's a charming place you have here. Nice to see old traditions maintained. Yeah, virtually unchanged in 147 years. Since the bank was founded, in fact. Well, you've come to us most highly recommended, Mr. Steed. Your bona fide is excellent. Yes, most excellent. Thank you. Yeah, the, uh, the nature of your business... Money. Yeah, naturally. naturally. Uh, shall we say one and a half million pounds? Mm. All right, then let's make it two million clear. Nice round figure, eh? Helps keep the accounts tidy. Uh, Mr. Steed. Just for a start, of course. We may want to double that figure eventually, but... Uh, uh, Mr. I... Steed, I admire your attack, but even on the strength of these references, a loan of two million pounds would be... No. <laughs> oh, my dear chap, no, you misunderstand me. I haven't come here to borrow. I want to Deposit? Deposit? Two million pounds? If we can agree on the proper way to invest it. You see, I represent a trust fund set up by one of the armed forces. We have very substantial funds to invest and thought that one of the better merchant banks might be the best way of placing them. Uh, more than that, I'm not at liberty to say at the moment. Yes, right. Not until I'm quite sure that your bank is the one to do business with. I'm sure you understand. Oh, absolutely. You're looking the market over, so to speak. Uh, so to speak, yes. Now, oh, Mr. Steed, I think you have made a wise choice in coming here first. Uh, this is your first call. <laughs> I can see you're as wily as your reputation, Mr. Borden. <laughs> uh, can I offer you a cigar? A custom roll? Oh, no, thank you. No, too early. 
Yes, yes, I feel at home here already. Mm. The air of ordered calm, a feeling of solidarity, of financial wisdom. Oh, I, I said, did you once have a kennel letter hanging on that wall? Steed indicated an empty space with his umbrella. Uh, yes, but how did you... Oh, a friend of yours happened to mention it. It was actually he who first suggested I came here. Poor fellow, um, Norman Todd Hunter. Todd Hunter, uh, yes, indeed. Try to do too much, poor fellow. Ah, John. Uh, Mr. Steed, I'd like you to meet my partner, John Harvey. Mm, how do you do, Mr. Steed? I'm glad to know you. Did I hear you mention Todd Hunter? Uh, Are you a friend of his? Well, we were acquaintances. Mm, pushed himself too hard to the limit. It's a familiar story these days, I'm afraid. Yes, very familiar. You have been having some bad luck of late, haven't you? Six company chairman in less than a year. <clears throat> yes, indeed. Well, Mr. Steed, what do you make of us? A bit archaic, you think? Trappings of a bygone age. <laughs> I'm afraid we still judge the man, if he's a credit risk or not, by the color of his socks. And Steed lifted an elegant shoe and showed a length of sock. Dark gray silk with a discreet motive. I hope I qualify. I'm sure you do. Oh, excuse me. Oh, um, by the way, Miss Borman, could you put me on to a good broker? Uh, the best. Frederick uh, Ewell, using it myself. Uh, this car will introduce you. Oh, thank you. Oh, and uh, this is my address. I'm giving a little house party on Thursday night. You know, I'd be most honored if you could attend. I'd be delighted. Mrs. Peel was having a far less pleasant afternoon. There was no offer of sherry and biscuits at McCombie's funeral parlor. Excuse me, do you happen to be the gentleman who dealt with the late Mr. Todd Hunter? The Todd Hunter? No. Oh, yes, the mahogany and walnut, the velvet lined, the solid brass handles, and the Gothic style. And I prefer the Corinthian flute myself. Oh, um, well, I've come to pick up his personal effects. I have the authority here to remove all he had on him. Um, there won't be an autopsy, will there? The autopsy? No, why should there be? The doctor signed the death certificate. Thrombosis. No, why should there be an autopsy? You didn't notice anything peculiar about the body? Oh, slight bruise above the heart, that's all. These things are over... Oh, that's funny. It's gone. What's gone? The, well, one of those bleep gadgets for answering service. It's gone, and yet, and yet I took it out of his pocket myself. His top pocket. It was clipped to his top pocket. About level with the heart? Uh, yes. Yes, I suppose it would be. Odd, isn't it? Very odd. Very odd indeed. Shield gives a confidence that actually shows. In your eyes. Put on Shield deodorant and it's dry in seconds. That's the way it stays right through the day. Shield never makes you feel sticky. It just protects you and keeps you dry, feminine, fresh. Wear Shield and the only thing you show is confidence. Shield gives a confidence that actually shows. In your eyes, in your eyes. No dirt can stand up to the cleaning power of cold water Omo. Mrs. Whelan had to wash greasy overalls. And I said, oh, well, I won't worry. I'll stick it into cold water Omo. And sure enough, every bit of grease is out. Once an Omo user, always an Omo user. The Avengers. Listen every evening, Monday to Friday, to John Steed and Emma Peel, The Avengers. Brought to you by the makers of Cold Water Omo. The Avengers. Donald Monat as John Steed and Diane Appleby as Emma Peel. Is adapted and directed by Dennis Falbig and produced by David Gooden. Mm -hmm.